Hello, my name is Owen Redwood, and this lecture is part of the Offensive Computer Security Open Courseware in 2015, hosted at HackAllTheThings.com. Today's lecture, Exploit Development 103, will cover heap, format string, and other exploitation techniques and exploit mitigation techniques and how to bypass them. So, the most useful resources are secure coding in C and C++. The textbook has some decent coverage of the subject, um, but there are also some good talks, heaps about heaps, and practical heap explo exploitation as well. A lot of this section is going to be recap from lecture three. And this is an old slide. It's essentially telling you that for each chunk, you're going to have metadata on the beginning, metadata on the bottom of it, and that chunks are grouped into bins, and usually there's some form of best fit algorithm to minimize waste, and it's also going to be a doubly linked list. Well, we've covered effectively um, the unlink algorithm and how it's exploited in a buffer workflow, and that when you overwrite, it will cause it to seg fault because when it tries to free the second one, it's going to be using um, user data as pointers and it's probably going to access memory improperly. So if you construct it so that you exploit the previous and use flags accordingly, you can trigger the unlink to think that, oh, hey, I should coalesce these. Um, the free algorithm to think, oh, hey, I should coalesce these and that will trigger the unlink macro, which will look at uh, the pointers that you provided, and this is the correct slide, just paste it wrong. And it will write a destination, write to an arbitrary destination, arbitrary value. So I suggest you re refresh on lecture three, it was better explained there. And there are standard C routines for operating the heap and dynamic memory, malloc, free, realloc. Uh, alloc, other ones we call. There's also BRK, SBRK, memory map, etc. And a very, very simple explanation of this is that if there's any user data that's controlling how much is malloced and it's being used in some unsafe function to perhaps dictate how much is copied, um, perhaps an attacker can overwrite something with a very large array or a string. Uh, another simple example, always unfortunately using stir copy in this, uh, this slide, I should change it. But effectively, um, this allows us to overwrite the metadata for buff2 as it grows towards higher memory. And so buff1 will write first, and then any overflows will write towards the next item. So buff2 will get overwritten. So, so let's look at a uh, an exercise with heap exploitation. All right, class. This is the heap three walkthrough um, for Protostars uh, challenge exercises from exploitexercises.com. There's two functions here. We are lucky enough to have the source. There's a winner function. Obviously, we have to get here somehow. And then there's the main function. And the main function has three, basically, strings that are being allocated and put on the heap. And obviously, there's stir copy. That's where the vulnerability is, clear as day. And then they are freed in reverse order, which doesn't really affect the exploitability of this. However, there's no direct call to winner, so we're going to find some way with this heap vulnerability to hijack execution. And from our previous lectures, we've already shown how exploiting the unlinked macro can allow for the arbitrary writing of a pointer address. So let's play around with it. And if we run it, it's going to exit right away and print dynamite failed. 
So we're going to have to find, we're going to have to add a breakpoint. And luckily, this thing was compiled with debugging symbols. So we can simply do break on source code line 24. And it's going to break right here before it gets to free C. So if we run it with A's, B's, and C's, we're able to break at that point and inspect what's going on beforehand. So one of these registers is going to point somewhere on the heap in order to coordinate with free to do its job. So let's inspect about 40 hex words. X, the first one stands for examine, and then the slash and what falls after it specifies what to format it as. So let's do what is an EAX, so 4C058. We don't see anything, but at the beginning we see 434343, and that's ASCII for a bunch of Cs repeating, so we're really close. Let's view a little earlier on it, and it seems like we found some sort of structure here. If you take a look, there's 41s, then it's 42s and 43s, so that's all A's, then B's and C's, and so we found the chunks on the heap. So, if we give it a ton of A's, we will obviously see what happens at this point. And it's overflowed all the way into chunk 3. Um, however, the, the data that we write into chunk B and C um, gets written anyways. And that just happens to be the order in which things are written. However, if you run this normally, you'll see that we are overwriting some things that the code itself does put in there. For instance, at the very first line, there's a, slat, a hex 29, and there's 29 here as well, and then before the four threes begin, there's another 29, and so on and so on, and these happen to be the, the metadata for the, the chunks on the heap specifying the size of each chunk. So what we want to do in order to exploit the unlink macro is that we need to provide a new dummy chunk header so that when it goes to free not A but the second one it frees it's going to th trigger the unlink macro because we're going to play with the previous and use flags and if you remember lecture 3 this should be pretty easy to understand so what we're going to do is <clears throat> I think the arrows are wrong here. This should be, boop. This should be there. I got copy and pasted wrong. There we go. And what we're going to do is have an exploit that looks roughly like this. We're going to take buffer A, and we're going to fill it up with 32 A's, and then we're going to start overriding the, the metadata on the heap. So let's give it two negative fours, which happens to be FC, FF, and then for the second chunk, this first part is going to get overwritten. And so when we enter in B, we're going to put in this data is still going to get written regardless. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a fake chunk header and it doesn't really matter what it is. So we're just going to have BB, BB, BB and we're going to have for the, the destination that we're going to do the arbitrary write and the value that we're going to do the arbitrary write be a, A, B, B, C, C, D, D, and then 4, 4, 3, 3, 2, 2, 1, 1, respectively. And we're going to see how this behaves when we get to the second free, and it encounters 
this exploit code. So you see that it's seg faulted. Let's inspect the registers after we see what EIP was pointing to. So we're moving EDX into EAX plus OXC, which happens to be EAX plus 12. So we see that <clears throat> EAX is AABBCCDD. That's what we wanted. And EDX is 44332211. This is exactly what I told you guys how the unlinked macro behaves. It's a good indicator that so far is so good. So <clears throat> we now have the ability to do an arbitrary write. Remember that the destination um, has 12 added to it, so you need to subtract wherever you're at, wherever you're pointing to, by 12. And then, obviously, when this instruction runs, it's going to add 12 to it and store this value there. So what we want to do is exploit something we talked about in lecture two, and that is the global offset table. And let's look at the global offset table for heat three. And we have these various functions that are indicated that are pointed to by the global offset table when it runs. And first time it runs, it's unpopulated, and on the first call, um, it gets found in memory. The off global offset table is updated and doesn't have to go find it ever again uh, after the first try. So we have our printf and put s, and let's look back at the source code. And we see there's a printf, so let's just make sure that it's there. So let's disassemble main, and we have the original malloc calls, then the stir copy calls. Let's keep going. <coughs> we have more of the stir copy calls, and then we have the free calls, and then we have the return. But before that, we actually have put s. And this is one of those tricky parts that you always encounter in exploit development of dealing with the compiler optimizations. And in this case, whenever printf is called, this compiler, and this is a very common case with most compilers, will actually call put s instead. If printf is called without any conversion specifiers, as you can see, dynamite failed, it's just a static string, it will call put s instead because it's a much more efficient implementation. It doesn't do perhaps the dozens of lines of assembly to look through the strings provided for any format specifier and do the expanding macro that's required to handle it. Instead, put s just statically puts it out to standard out. Very simple. However, this is one of the nuances of exploit development that can throw a lot of people off. So what we're going to target is, despite printf being in the source code, we're going to have to target put s. So let's go back. and find the address for put s. That's going to be 0804B128. And then we're going to have to subtract 12 from it. And that happens to be 0804B11C. You can double check the math. I've already done it just for sake of demo. And so what we're going to do is we want to take, instead of write to AABBCCDD, we're going to write to the global offset table here. So 1C, B1, 0, 4, 0, 8. Remember, little endian, this, this definitely matters. And Let's just leave that for now. It's going to hit the breakpoint. We haven't haven't decided what we want to write there yet, but we can verify that 
it has worked. Zero X, so let's look at the global offset table now. No, perhaps it hasn't. So it's trying to write One of the constraints we see that in free, it's using EAX as a pointer, and if we have it pointing to 44332211, well, that's probably not a valid memory segment for writing to, so it's going to seg fault. So we need to give it <clears throat> our actual intended target, and since the goal of this is to run winner, Let's see where winner is. So it is at 8048864. So let's put that as the value that we're writing instead of 44332211. So 64880408. And CCCC for string C, we still don't care about that. And let's keep going. Let's see what happens now. Still seg fault. Let's see what's going on with EIP. That looks like the same instruction. And it's trying to take EAX and use it as a pointer. Let's see what's going on. That's winner. So if you're trying to write to winner, that's going to be in the dot text segment. And the dot text segment is where the machine instructions are, and it is never writable. It is just executable and readable. So that's what's triggering the seg fault. However, let's see if our arbitrary write worked. Um, we have it written on the left side of the screen, so it's 804B11C. <clears throat> and did I type it right? Yep. So what I forgot to do was continue at the breakpoint. So now we've actually hit a segmentation fault. And let's examine what we are writing. It doesn't appear that it is correct. In fact, I'm actually mistaken. We need to add 12 to this. So put S should be at this. And it has indeed overwritten the global offset table entry for put as with the address of winner. However, EIP is still using that value that we're writing as a destination for a write, which is a problem because it's, as I indicated, in dot text segment. So what we need to do is instead use a segment of memory to jump to that we can also write to because one of the constraints of this code that we're having to exploit is that it needs the value that we write here to also be something that it can use as a destination for a pointer because in the last stage of the unlink macro it's going to use that so what we're going to do 
is construct an exploit such that we have an offsled and we're going to point it to the heap. We're going to point it to chunk A. And we're going to provide some shell code that's going to jump to winner. And it should be pretty straightforward. So what we're going to do is instead of this exploit, we're going to provide it an exploit with shellcode and an offsled. Effectively, the shellcode is going to be push the address of winner on the stack and then call return. Return is going to be effectively the same as pop EAP. So if you push something on the stack and immediately call return, it's effectively putting that into EIP. It should be noted that on x86, you cannot directly assign anything to EIP. Um, so the, the compiled assembly for the shellcode, the opcodes are the following. And so 68648808408, this is actually the opcodes for pushing the address of winner. And if we see on the right <clears throat> that the address of winner is printed here, um, 08048864. And so you'll see that little endian encoding is going to be 08048864, as I said. And 68 is the opcode for the push instruction. C3 is the opcode for the turn instruction here. And so this is a pretty concise payload. And so what we're going to do first is pad it with 20 NOPs, which is the opcode for that is 90. No op, or sometimes just referred to as NOP, is effectively the same as move EAX EAX. It's functionally useless. Um, and what it does is provide you a nice cushion if you're not sure you can precisely target something. If you land it on a very large sequential amount of no operations or functionally useless operations, it will keep executing until it perhaps hits your shellcode that you landed after it. So what we're doing is having a nice NOP sled that's 20 NOPs, then our payload that's basically push the address of winner and then C3 which is red and as indicated here here are some just filler bytes I'm going to play with the filler bytes and show you actually um, how sometimes following write-ups and other people's exploits isn't so easy and there's sometimes nuances dealing with the constraints of given code paths that uh, can really be frustrating the fillers bytes here actually have some significance that are completely omitted in all the write-ups for this challenge. Then what we have is the fake header for this next buffer, uh, this next fake chunk that is used to trigger the unlink macro to exploit. And then we have chunk B and we are pointing back to the, the heap. And we found that simply just by examining the heap and figuring out where to point to. And we are pointing, uh, we are rewriting the global offset table entry for put s with this address to jump back to the heap. And so what happens is when we run it, it's going to print out, that wasn't too bad now, was it? which happens to be the string printed out by winner. So to dive into this, to recap actually, let's run it again. This is what the heap looks like. We see that at the very top row, there is the hex 29, which is the size of chunk A. And then the data is filled with all 9090909090, which is the NOP sled. And then here, 
at the second end of the second row, you see the payload that we've put in there, and it wraps around to the next row, and we see these garbage pipes 4141, and they keep going. Um, this is partially for alignment, and then we see the negative four bytes, which is FFFFFFFC that we've written here, and that's the fake trunk header. And then after that is the the placeholder, which is the four two four twos for the dummy uh, trunk header, and then our destination in the global offset table, and then finally the pointer to point back to the not sled. And that is essentially the exploit. The rest of it is all fluff. So let's play around with these filler bytes. And if we change them to certain values, it will actually cause the program, the exploit, to fail. For instance, we got a segmentation fault this time. And let's see what's going on. Let's examine what's going on in EIP. It's trying to move EDX into EAX plus 12, and EAX is negative 4, and we guarantee that memory address is not writable. So I don't feel like reverse engineering exactly why this is occurring from just changing these six bytes here from effectively what was 4.1 to CC, which is the track instruction, which is very, very useful for debugging, and that will probably end up on one of the exams. What is the opcode for the track instruction? It is CC. Um, so that's something to be aware of, that sometimes your filler data does matter and will affect the constraints of the code paths that you're exploiting. And so when I return it to four ones, it doesn't seg full. Anyways. Now let's discuss how to defeat the safe unlinking technique that was introduced to mitigate this style of exploitation on the heap. In glibc version 2.3.6, they introduced the safe unlink check that was designed to prevent exploits of buffer overflow and double free vulnerabilities from targeting the unlink macro, as we've already demonstrated. However, the community found out very early on that it was not perfect. The Malik Maleficarium and follow-up article Malik Des Maleficarium, uh, as I've linked here, are very good reads and demonstrate some bypass techniques to still target safe unlinking. And ultimately, researchers discover these bypasses by simply investigating the source code of the mitigations. Here, we have the nice and concise uh, de uh, code for the unlink macro with the safe unlink check. What is happening here is that the unlink macro is is provided the uh, pointer to the chunk, the, the previous chunk, and the forward chunk. These should come from the pointer itself, as they are in the uh, pointers provided in the heat metadata, and that is how the f this macro is typically called. Safety check uses the glibc and gcc function built-in expect. The first parameter is a truth statement. The second parameter is the expected value of the first statement. This first statement is a bit convoluted, but it effectively all reads out to the forward pointer's back pointer. Sorry, the next chunk's back pointer should equal this given chunk that we've been passed. And the previous chunk's forward pointer should also equal this pointer that we've been given. However, they evaluate the inverse of that and expect it instead to be false. Thus, you could translate it to instead to make more sense. Forward uh, chunk's back pointer should equal this chunk, and the back chunk's forward pointer should equal 
this chunk as well. Instead, they have, just to clarify, the next chunk's back pointer does not equal this current chunk, or if the previous chunk's forward pointer does not equal this chunk, then there is a problem. Because it expects that, ultimately, to be false. In the case that it is true, however, it aborts and says there has been a corrupted doubly linked list. That is the essence of the safety check here in the safe unlink macro. So it, appoint, it expects the pointers here to point to valid chunks. At least they should both be pointing to the given P. This is, however, still exploitable if you manage to have things aligned just right on the stack. If, in a buffer overflow, you can corrupt the metadata of the next chunk and then trigger that chunk to be freed, if you point the forward and the back pointers to somewhere such that regardless of whether or not it is a, a regular or a corrupted chunk, the offsets at which it finds the forward pointer and the back pointer for these chunks point back to the given target chunk, which I will admit is hard to pull off because that requires a great deal of information about that location and memory on the heap, which is hard to get. You can, however, bypass the safe unlink macro and still pull off this style of exploitation. It is simply, I'll summarize, done by spoofing the chunk's validity, assuming you can buffer overflow that much, by placing valid pointers at these offsets. Hopefully, later in this semester, we'll have a walkthrough of a CTF problem that will exploit the safe unlink macro in this fashion. But of course, there are other styles of heap exploitation that we need to cover other than targeting the classic unlink macro and the safe unlink alternative. Use after freeze are an extremely important concept to understand. They involve any form of data, objects, or structures that are allocated on the heap, freed at some point, and then end up used again. Perhaps there's multiple pointers pointing to the same object, only one of them is used for free, and the other one is used in some fashion afterwards, whether it's for reading, using a pointer for reading data, for writing data, or for executing code. Think of it as those three simple actions, similar to permissions, right? So you can break it down into data versus function pointers. Now, if data is used after free, if it's just regular data, not involving any pointers, say it's just like a string on the heap or a Boolean variable or integer, it's usually not so exploitable. It can't redirect some write, it's not used as a pointer. It maybe can influence some branches of logic, some conditional statements. Maybe you can, at best, trigger secondary buffer overflow or some other vulnerability. But this is, this is very uncommon. These are usually not directly targeted in use after free attacks. Instead, pointers are where it's at. So data pointers are either linked list or pointer to strings, etc. And how they're used is essentially what dictates uh, the difficulty and style of their exploitation. If it's simply used for reading, uh, say, a string, it can probably only at best be used to leak information. Um, in other words, do an information disclosure attack, or a mem leak, is sometimes also called. If it's used for writing data, if you can change where the destination of the write is, that's usually far easier to exploit. And in fact, read primitives in terms of use after free rarely allow for uh, landing a remote code execution bug and can only be used for disclosing memory. A write primitive usually enables uh, some form of remote code execution or code execution attack. So, as opposed to data, if there's an object and it has some function pointers, say like it's in C++ and there's a virtual method, it then would have 
a V table pointer and if this can be this object is freed and then the V table method is used later this is usually far easier to exploit than all the previous examples and you can usually point it directly to some payload or some other function that is instead directly exploitable. They are, however, rare in C, uh, regular C, whoops, um, as most applications don't use objects with function pointers in them and then store them on the heat. Um, even rare is uh, <laughs> taking in user data and using it directly as a function pointer. It's probably only in the realm of uh, terrible applications and C plus, sorry, CTF uh, early challenges or beginner challenges. I digress. Um, the general steps of a use after free exploit are first to populate the heap uh, with dummy data, uh, fill it with various objects at first to set up some expected structure that you want to work with. Trigger the free of one of the heap chunks, perhaps in the middle, and then populate uh, the heap, perhaps via a heap spray, with um, malicious data. Typically, it would be considered a payload or a stage of the use after free exploit. And then trigger the vulnerable use of the free chunk, um, perhaps of the secondary pointer, or etc. However, it works out in the application. There is a race condition, however, in every uh, use after free exploit, that the freed chunk that you want to target to reuse may get populated by something else before the attacker's exploit can overwrite it. Multi-threaded applications are known for having only one heap, and this is set forth in the C standard in 2003, but it may differ per operating system runtime, but for a multi-threaded server, all of the clients connected to that server would be working with the same heap. So that is a... Uh, uh, which would be extremely difficult to land a use after free with a high amount of users due to this race condition. Use after frees since 2009 have been the predominant um, style of vulnerability in CVEs being disclosed. Prior to that, they were a very small sliver, but they have usurped stack overflows and integer overflows and heap buffer overflows to take up essentially that market share of the disclosed vulnerabilities. So, I've put together a bonus lecture um, going through a CTF challenge that is a, um, a use after free vulnerability. It exploits, it requires the exploitation of a pointer that is only used for reading a string. And we go through the process of learning it, uh, how the application works, automating the interaction with the application. This is the first baby steps of building the skeleton for an exploit, discovering the vulnerability, reverse engineering everything, and multiple attempts at developing the exploit. It is absolutely worth doing because it demonstrates um, essentially the art of exploiting a database to use after free that's just a read, uh, and uh, it is something definitely worth your time. Anyways, function pointers, as I've already stated, are a very attractive use after free target due to the ease of their exploitation. In the case of C style regular function pointers that you would find in structs or uncommon structs, um, you might be able to populate the heap chunk and directly overwrite that function pointer and point it to an arbitrary payload or ROP chain that you can introduce in some other previous user input. Alternatively, in C++ style uh, applications, you might have an object with virtual methods which would have then vtable pointers in that heap chunk should that object be in a malloc heap chunk. And um, this is actually more common um, between C and C++ 
uh, because as I said, I usually don't find structs on the heap with just function pointers, um, but they do exist. But vtable pointers on he the heap in objects is actually more common. Um, however, there is less freedom in exploitation. Um, if you can overwrite the vtable pointer, um, you can uh, typically point it to somewhere arbitrary in memory, and then uh, you have to account for the offset because it always calls into the vtable by some index, and the vtable is just a list of function pointers, and the index is that offset, either the first, second, third, fourth, or etc. Um, function pointer in that vtable. Heap sprays are another technique that are primarily used to facilitate um, an exploit. They are not a direct form of exploitation themselves, but they are d used to um, defeat or overcome that race condition uh, step where you have to populate the freed chunk with something malicious um, before that un vulnerable use of the used uh, of the freed chunk is triggered. The technique is very common on malicious web pages that exploit browser zero days or vulnerabilities. Um, JavaScript is a major uh, culprit in heap sprays as JavaScript is designed to allow users or websites to interact with all uh, objects in the DOM model, which we will cover uh, in a few lectures when we discuss web applications. But essentially, for binary exploitation purposes, JavaScript allows attackers to allocate arbitrary amounts and sizes of heap chunks and populate them with arbitrary values. Thus, it's very effective for pulling off heap sprays. Um, it can also be accomplished with other scripting or client-side scripting, rather, languages, VBScript, ActionScript, HTML5, also, some images and media formats allow for heap sprays to occur. By itself, it's obviously not a security issue, the, uh, the ability to do heap spraying, but um, as I said, it's a technique that's used to land an exploit. Heap Feng Shui is a more sophisticated alternative to heap spraying. It involves allocating the heap blocks in the right order and sizes to uh, manipulate the caches, the fast lists, the uh, various different optimizations that may exist per heap uh, allocator, which again depends on the compiler, in order to uh, make it all very predictable. And um, there's a good presentation on it here by Alex Todorov. Uh, and uh, yeah. In many Linux systems, typically there's only one heap um, in a process. There's nothing preventing a module or shared object from creating another heap or some other um, memory location to do dynamic memory management. And in Windows, this is actually quite common. In Windows targets, it's very common for DLLs to alloc extra heap spaces and sometimes they specify the memory permissions for these in very insecure ways um, that allow for attackers to later use these locations for stack pivoting and other forms of exploitation or at least the development of exploitation and <clears throat> often in doing so the DLLs will hold pointers to the heaps that they use and those pointers are often targeted for info leaks and um, to read more about this, there's a good presentation on this topic, uh, Black Hat 2009, that I've linked below. Now let's discuss some of the nitty gritty of real world heap exploitation. The primary problem with heap exploitation is that it is generally unreliable. It takes multiple attempts, usually, to guarantee success. 
And there are various reasons for this. Heat fragmentation is the primary one, and there are a number of factors that cause it. Optimizations, like caching, fast lists, and fast bins. Exploit mitigations, like address space layout randomization, which we cover later in this lecture. Multi-threading, and other application design issues may all contribute to causing heat fragmentation and complicating the exploitation of buffer overflows, use after freeze, and so on. We've covered a number of techniques so far, and typically I see others only covering a single or a couple techniques in total, and it really behooves one to know all of the possible techniques. Some of them are unique to the compiler itself, or unique to the operating system sometimes also. So to recap, we're going to go over some of the common techniques and the ones we've covered so far, just to summarize things all up before we dive into format string exploitation. The common technique that I've seen dozens of presentations on is the heap spray, and in each chunk they have a knob sled and shell code. This is not actually the primary exploit itself, and does not actually involve the hijacking of the EIP or the instruction pointer to point to malicious code. Instead, this is a technique that is used to set up the payload to be in a predictable spot. And this is useful for when memory is unpredictable, which may be a common case uh, in many targets, especially remote ones. And so, essentially, the heap starts off on the left, only the blue spots are lose, used, and after the spray, all of the intermediate chunks between the two, uh, between the used chunks, are occupied, as well as many of the chunks past the uh, allocated space. Um, this allows for taking a f function pointer or a return address that's been overwritten and pointing it just to generally this neighborhood. Typically, it will land on a NOP sled and jump into the middle of the shellcode. It's not reliable 100% of the time, but it's a decently uh, useful technique. Use after free exploits uh, follow a kind of similar approach. Um, that they also rely on heap spraying uh, often. Not always, though. We've covered how they're different for linked lists and data pointers and function pointers and so on. And they also differ for C++ style V tables. This is a good demonstration. Um, and finally, the unlink exploitation demonstration we gave, which again specifically dem uh, targets glibc and gcc. There are other memory allocators, each have their own quirks. Um, there's RTL alloc heap for Windows, there's Horde allocator, there's Google's TE malloc, there's TC malloc, which is the thread caching malloc, and so on. <sighs> What's worth noting here is that each one of these has unique and largely unexplored vulnerabilities in the way they do things in their doubly linked list algorithms and for allocating and freeing, etc. Management, maintenance, caching, optimization, and so on. Uh, there are unexplored, undiscovered exploitation techniques that are unique to each of these. Probably the second biggest one would be Windows with RTL alloc heap and so on. And so these new exploitation techniques, I've seen some people call them kind of meta days because there are entirely new ways to exploit vulnerabilities or previously unknown vulnerability categories. But I digress. On top of the potential for custom or different memory allocators, there are often applications that implement their own pointer types and pointer libraries or object types that uh, keep track of cross-references and the amount of uses and references 
um, for each pointer or for each object. We've covered some of them in the type confusion bonus lecture and uh, their goals range from preventing heat bugs to preventing memory leaks to uh, sanitizing addresses like ASAN um, and so on. Ultimately it makes heat bugs harder to find. They're still definitely there and also harder to exploit. Um, there are other, also for each compiler obscure flags and optimizations that always will make things harder and the race condition problem is a real struggle. So let's continue to format string exploitation and have two demos on this. The slides here are very much a recap. We covered in lecture three at the end of it um, the flags, the width, the dot precision specifier, the length modifier, and finally the conversion specifier. All of these let you see values on the stack. However, percent %n is the only one that allows you to write. Nothing will be printed, but it writes the amount of characters written so far to a corresponding pointer located on the stack. For instance, uh, if you have a format string vulnerability where you just print user buffer and you pass it percent %s is, it's going to reach read each uh, value it finds on the stack for each percent %s as a pointer and dereference it and continue until it seg faults or until all the specifiers are satisfied. <coughs> the, the above example uses uh, the width specifier to print out not perhaps 32-bit hex values but as 64-bit or 8 bytes and this can make uh, when hunting format strings and mem leaks can make finding it a little more human friendly. Um, <coughs> and this will this will increment. It should be noted um, the pointer hues used to handle the variable amount of arguments uh, by eight each time, which is the VA uh, list iterator however it is implemented for the given variable argument function that it has the for, uh, format string vulnerability. You can move it forward by other values, not just eight or four, but typically just those. <coughs> and this lets you view, this technique lets you view arbitrary memory locations. What's happening is it's pushing the pointer forward until percent %s starts looking at the own string here and then it just then it dereferences this value on the stack as a pointer to a legitimate string address and prints it out accordingly so it'll print out the string uh, at the address 04e5f5de and this above is little endian We've talked about writing to a memory address and <clears throat> effectively using the same technique instead of a percent %s here we use a percent %n we'll write the number of characters written so far to the address provided here assuming this all works out correctly and you can use a width specifier to increase the number of characters written so far to specify exactly what number you would like to write but it only works well for writing small values. So <clears throat> we need to explore how this can be used and perhaps with the length specifier to pull off various format string exploits. And we're going to start with format one challenge demo from Protostar from exploitexercises.com. On the left, we have the source code and there are two functions. There is vuln and there is main. And you can see that main takes in arguments and it passes the first command line argument to vuln. And it takes in a string, it prints out the string, and this is clearly where the format string vulnerability is. And 
it's asking us if we have modified the target, and that's the goal, to modify the target. The target variable, however, is here, uh, global variable, and this is going to be in the .bss segment, which is far away from the stack. So let's throw a bunch of format strings, conversion specifiers at format one, and we can see that it is indeed printing out uh, memory from the stack. And what we want to do is pass it a string and then be able to find where on the stack this is. And so we're putting periods here so that we can count how far it is. And you can see that if we're looking for the hex representation of AAAA, it should be 414141, and you don't see it. And what we can do is instead of just passing a ton of percent x periods, we can do something a little more clever. Let's use some bash scripting to give it a range from 1 to 200, and we can tell it to directly access uh, variables on the stack um, in this fashion. So we have this for loop, what we're going to do is we're going to run format 1, and we're going to give it four A's, and we're going to give it the, the iterator that we're going to iterate over, and it's going to start from the first value, then do it second, third, fourth, sixth, seventh, and then escape a dollar sign symbol so it prints out correctly. Most of the time when you have trouble with format strings, it's probably because you're not formatting something just quite right. And so we want to print out values in the stack. And what we want to do is filter out cases. We can just run this as is. Oops, forgot to do. And you see, we need to filter out all this information. Like, we're not interested in seg faults. So, get rid of the done, get rid of the semicolon, grep for when it's printing out the representation of AAAA. -A -A. And didn't find any. Um, and this may be a padding error. Let's, uh, not a padding problem, I'm sorry, I meant to say an alignment issue, alignment issue. Let's add a little statement that evaluates whether or not this grep matched anything. So if it's true, then we're going to echo what the value of i is. We're going to break this loop. We're going to end this if statement, and then we're going to be done. So this runs, it doesn't find anything, it doesn't echo out what i is. So since it's likely an alignment issue, let's try putting stuff at the beginning. So I'm going to just put one byte in front of the four a's that I have. Run it, nada, nothing. Let's try another one. Nothing. And the third one, likelihood of this working is ever decreasing. And the fourth one is at the point you should give up on alignment because now you've come full circle if you're working with a four character string anyways. So let's try adding it on the end of the four character string. One did not work. Add a second one. And there we go. So we did get it to line right and it happens to on the 124th hex value print out 41414141 when given a, a conversion specifier to print out a hex value on the stack. So the reason it's so far up the stack is that in Volm when print is called print is a, a stack frame deeper in Volm and Volm is a stack frame deeper from 
main. So the argument for this are actually a bit higher than that, and that's why it's effectively so far uh, up the stack. So what we need to do is now that we know where on the stack our input is going to be, we need to now use the percent %n conversion specifier to overwrite target here. It doesn't matter what we write it with. It just has to be have some value written to it. So let's look at the symbols, find the target. It's going to be a 3, 8. Okay. So what we're going to do is format one, and I'm going to pass it in through Python so it prints nice. I'm going to give it the destination. So this 960408, and then we have 124 is a magic number, and we're going to give it N here, and didn't work. Maybe this was the trick. Oh, we forgot the alignment issue. So 08, we need BB here. And boom, we have modified the target. That means that this format string exploit successfully wrote some, some value to target all the way up the B, at the BSS segment, which means that this has been a successful exploit. So that was a rather simple demonstration of writing an arbitrary yet small value to a specific memory address. Whether or not it's on the stack or the heap, we managed to target the BSS segment. It just happens to be, as long as the text the memory segment is writable, you can use that technique to write to it. However, what if we want to write a larger value, perhaps a pointer to an arbitrary memory address? Well, what we're going to explore in the next demo is a technique that uses multiple writes to write small values and each write, doesn't matter what is written in the more significant bytes, is then followed up by an, a write in, starting at the next address in which the least significant byte of it is used to write at that specific byte, and then so on. It doesn't matter what follows it, but it's followed by another write that cleans up whatever is past it and uses the least significant byte to set the third byte, and then so on for the fourth byte. And what happens over four writes is that by shifting one byte over each time in such a manner, you're able to control a pointer address at an arbitrary location, which is very useful. However, if you combine this with <clears throat> length specifiers, you can control exactly how much is written, which can make this process overall cleaner. So let's explore format 4 challenge of Protostar, which is one of the harder ones, and use multiple writes to redirect execution to a winning condition. All right, class, this is the demo for format 4 challenge from Protostar from AskWhatExercises.com. This is going to be a demonstration of using multiple format string writes to rewrite a address in memory. What we're going to have to do is use a length specifier to use short writes so that we are more precise because using formats during exploits to, in a single write, write a very large value is very cumbersome and usually completely infeasible. So the source code is as following. It takes in some arguments but never passes them to a volume function which it then calls, and on the stack here, it allocates a buffer, and it safely reads in from user input, standard in, and then it prints the buffer and exits right away. So there's no logic going on. And the win function is hello up here, and target, I think, is just left over. There's nothing to do with that. 
And what we have to do is redirect execution to void hello. Um, you might see that a different exit is called here. So in the heap demo we just did, uh, we targeted the global offset table with the heap buffer overflow, uh, which allowed us to do an arbitrary write by exploiting how the unlink macro works. And what we're going to do is put, use multiple format string writes to redirect the global offset table's exit function, which is located here at 08049724 to the win condition, which is hello. So what we want to do is overwrite the global offset table for, en for entry for exit and point it to hello. So we're going to discover where on the stack in our format string starts and We'll do that with some quick Python. Whoops. Don't need the parentheses. And let's see. 200s, first, second, third, here are the four ones at the starting of the fourth index. Now, what we want to do is somehow write this value with a format string exploit. And that gets a little tricky. What we want to start off whenever you're doing any form of advanced format string exploit like this is start taking notes. And so we're going to break down byte by byte what these values translate to. So the least significant byte before is going to be at one, going to translate to 180 decimals. We can probably very easily write a string that's 180 characters long and put the amount of characters written so far into an address pointed to the first byte here. So the, 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 Next byte in exit will be 08049725. The next byte will be 26. The next byte will be 27. And this will be the most significant byte in exit's address. So, what we want to do is overwrite perhaps byte by byte the value store here so that we reconstruct the address to hello in the global offset table so we hijack the functionality of the exit. Now what whoops so what we're going to do is break down these byte by byte and so b4 translates to 180, 84 translates to 132 which you can see is shorter than 180 and <clears throat> this is a little bit tricky because we can only expand the amount of characters that we've written and thus expand the total count. We can't really go down, but by limiting it uh, to a short or byte write, we can wrap around to whatever we desire. So as long as the least significant byte here, or whatever we expand it to, is represented in hex by 84. This will be written and should satisfy our needs. So for the hex 184, that translates to 388 characters. 284 is 644 characters. 384 is 900 characters. 484 is 1,156 characters. And then for our other more significant bytes. Um, we run into a similar problem. Um, 04 is simply 4, and 08 is simply 8. And it may be easier just to group them together and look at what 0804 translates to, or hex 804. And in decimal, that's 2,052. 
All right. So in theory, if we group these together, we don't want to target this one. We want to target this because it will overwrite the 27th and the 26th. The first write, if we address it as 24th, will be fine. 25th will write the correct byte there and overwrite any of the uh, additional side effect output from the first one. Um, and there's some, I say that because in some cases you could pull this off without the length specifier simply by just overwriting whatever unnecessary output is produced from this having to wrap around and continually increase to your least significant byte suits your needs. Um, so you can do this without a length specifier and limiting it like that. So what we're going to do is we're going to write the 24th byte, 25th byte, and then the 27th and 26th bytes together and shoot for the highest uh, expansion being uh, finally we will write 2052 characters. So what we're going to do so we're going to start with the 24th byte, the least significant byte address, and we're going to continue and then the next byte we're going to address whoops, six, nine, seven, zero, four, zero, eight, and then finally twenty-seven. And now is where we begin expanding things. Um, so far we have written three addresses. Each one of these takes up a character, takes up a byte, so addresses are four bytes long times three is twelve. So the first one we have to write is 180. So 180 minus 12 is 168. So percent 168 hex and then what we do is percent the fourth we'll do a short write and we're going to write that to the, the first address we have here which as we remember discovering is uh, the fourth index on the stack is where our string begins. We found that by shooting A's in there first and uh, pushing uh, percent X's after that and counting where it occurs. So that will expand the, the string accordingly to pull off the first right. Now we have to worry about the second right. So we have to figure out what we put here to expand it such that the rest of this is all going to work. Now, let's start with hex 184. Let's pull up the calculator. And so 388 minus what we've written so far is 209x. And then we're going to write, use the fifth index. And then we have to handle the last one, which is going to be 2052 minus what's written so far, which is 388, which is given up here. And we're going to have to expand this if this will work this large by that much. And, whoops, percent the sixth index. see what happens. You can see that uh, it seems to be working, at least expanding the strain because it cleared the whole screen, but it is seg faulting. So for the second expansion, let's try the next one, 284. Remember, we're just going for any value that's going to pull this off and have the least significant byte be 84. So what we're going to do is 644 four minus what's written so far in the first row, which is 180. So I have 464 four now, and we have to 
recalculate the last one, which is going to be 2052 minus 644 given to us by here. So 1408, let's see, nope, seg fault. So let's keep giving it a go. So 900 now minus 180. We're going to try hex 384. So 720, so 720. And then have to recalculate the last one. And that's going to be 2052 minus 100 and 1152. Nope, no luck yet. Seg fault still. All right, so let's try the last one, 1156, given to us by here, minus what is written so far on the first one. So we use 976, and then recalculate this, 2052 minus 1156, so we 896. And let's make sure we're printing this all out right. Uh, so the mistake was that we need to escape this dollar sign, and in the end, it all worked. It's just a minor formatting issue. So what we did to recap is planned out what the bytes represent for the address that we want to write, figure out how to attack it, and we had to um, go about continually trying values that the least significant byte would work for us, and then do a demonstrated also a two byte write and pulling that off with a very large value. And we were able to redirect the execution to hello and win the challenge. All right, those demos are over, and the rest of the lecture is dedicated to defenses against exploit techniques, and we're going to talk about executable security mechanisms, or as we call them, exploit mitigations. So one of the key questions we're going to ask through this lecture is, who should protect what? Obviously, we should expect the developers to write secure code and obviously not have any bugs at all, which is unreasonable. But is there are there ways to for bugs that happen to be vulnerabilities mitigate their exploitability. As we saw that simply just pulling off exploits can be hard. Sometimes even the most mundane things can affect the exploitability of a given bug. For instance, in one of the previous demos, the, the filler data itself in our exploit actually caused problems depending on what we chose it to be. And that happened to influence the various constraints that were in the code paths that we were basically executing. So are there things that we can instill when compiling a program that mitigate exploits? Are there things that while, a process, while an operating system is running a process can mitigate various different exploit techniques or um, targets? And Similarly, for hardware, if we remember the, the debate between von Neumann and Harvard architecture, the main thing with the Harvard architecture is they can distinguish between data and instructions. So let's talk about Linux exploit mitigations. And the first one we were going to talk about is the NX bit. This flag effectively means never execute. It employs the pot the the policy that if it is writable, it should not be executable. This prevents execution of any data on the stack, and sometimes the heap, although the heap can be used in, for instance, in C++ and various very object-oriented approaches, sometimes the heap may be executable uh, necessarily. <clears throat> 
Um, a way that an attacker can bypass this is by re reusing existing uh, library code and existing code in the binary, such as return to live C attacks, which I believe we covered, may not have demoed, but will be demoed later. And uh, return to live C came out uh, probably about 10 years ago or so, and uh, it's very, very simple technique and it completely defeats NX. There are compiler um, uh, extensions that can protect stack and mitigate stack exploitation. Um, there is Stack Guard, which uses canaries uh, that are basically um, a random value that's padded before return addresses. Whenever return is triggered, it checks to see if that value is still there. If it's been overwritten, it aborts, prevents the execution of an exploit. However, um, the GCC team does not adopt stack guard, uh, and this only protects the return address in the stack, and there are GS cookies in place instead. Now, of course, I have to mention the definitive article on breaking stack cookies from Frack. Um, this link here. And just to illustrate, canary slash stack cookie is going to be placed in certain places at each stack frame, perhaps. And in general, it suffers from a major flaw due to the design of C. For any remote target, say a server that's written in C, say a network daemon, a web server, a file server, or etc. If it clones the process or forks to handle a new connection, what's going to happen is that it's going to get for each fork, each process that spawned, the same cookie as the parent process on the stack. And if the attacker attempts exploitation and the stack cookie check detects a corruption of the cookie, it's going to abort but it's not going to crash the parent process. But in the next connection attempt, what will happen is that the attacker will get the same stack cookie. It's because that does not change. And so, this ultimately only really definitively is useful against privilege escalation and local exploitation. Against remote attackers, However, it allows them the opportunity to essentially keep retrying and essentially brute force the cookie. However, if the child process after a fork calls exec VE, that will spin up a new process space and thus new stack canaries will be generated. And this was actually all illustrated on the man page. Um, and to highlight the, the, the main details is that if all you do is fork, you're providing that uh, you're providing the remote users the same um, address space, cookies, and etc. Uh, per connection consistently. However, if you call exec ve, that reinitializes everything. All the mitigations, all of the cookies, and etc. So, if you're designing a server, something that handles remote users, after a fork or a clone to handle incoming new connection, one should call exec VE to execute some form of sub-process or program to initialize the cookies again and the address space and that will also kick off address space layout randomization again. I'm pretty sure that without exec VE, you're provided with the same um, address space per each fork, which can also lead to another factor of brute forcing in terms of address space layout randomization guessing uh, to say land exploits or various types of bugs like info leaks. Another technique is ASLR, which stands for Address Space Layout Randomization. 
And the reason I covered the process layout of Windows and Linux memory segments is that ASLR will randomize, uh, depending on the implementation, the starting address at which each segment is loaded in. So it's not easy to reliably point to something in memory. Now, <clears throat> when in order to enable it, you have to have a compatible Linux kernel. It was adopted in, I believe, the 2.4 or the 2.6 kernel. I can't remember off the top of my head right now. But if it's if this file proc sys kernel randomized VA space is set to zero, it's turned off. But if it's turned to one, it's partial ASLR. If it's turned to two, it's full ASLR. And the contents inside each memory segment are not reordered. They're not randomized at all. It's just the starting address is randomized. Now, there are two main ways to break this, in just in general, across implementations. Um, there is simple brute forcing, and for 32-bit systems, it's much easier because there's less entropy to beat. And then there's finding a mem leak, and then uh, doing uh, return-oriented programming relative to a memory location that you know. <clears throat> this technique, ASLR, is very effective and outright breaks any shellcode with hard-coded addressing techniques. And it also breaks return to library style attacks um, unless you have a mem leak into the library. And what you'll find is that for ASLR, uh, when it's set to full, a way to verify that it is running on a given process is to check the proc, uh, whatever the PID, and then maps file is across a number of iterations. You should see that the addresses here should differ per uh, execution for every single segment. For the heap, for the stack, for the VDSO, and etc. <clears throat> However, as I said, 32-bit ASLR does not have enough entropy, does not have enough randomness, and is rather easy to brute force. And if you're trying to brute force ASL, uh, a runnable service that is predicted by ASLR, you're probably going to see that activity happen in the middle of the night and when no one's watching, because it could take some time. If it happens in the middle of the day while system administrator is watching and you don't have someone there overnight, it's more likely to be pulled off. So, I should note that for network services, usually the, the model is that you have the, the host process listening for connections, and for each connection will fork, and the child will handle the, the, the new connection, while the server will <clears throat> Uh, keep continuing to listen for new connections. This gives advantages uh, attacks. Well, that's not even a word. This gives attackers an advantage because they can bring down the child fork and repeatedly attack it in a brute force attack until it eventually works, while without bringing down the service. If, um, if for instance, the host simply handed somehow each connection one by one. A single exploit that failed, exploit attempt that failed, would perhaps seg fault the process and the service would be down, which would be a denial of service attack, but the attacker wouldn't gain access to whatever they wanted. So <clears throat> there are custom uh, enhancements to the suite of Linux security. Um, the PAX Linux kernel patch implements better ASLR, implements better NX, um, has also more efforts to mitigate other techniques like return to libc, and has uh, <clears throat> more hardenings against buffer overflows, and there is a pretty good frack article about it here. GR security is also uh, related to the PAX team. Um, they've partnered up, and the GR security patch is optimized for web servers and offers very useful uh, hardening features to prevent uh, LD preload attacks, much better ASLR, 
so on and so on. Um, it's pretty much if you're running a web server or any form of Linux server that is exposed to users, it should be running some form of uh, hardened kernel. And this is a great op uh, option. So this blog post from CERT has a really good discussion on the actual randomness of stock ASLR. And if we blow this up and look, that if ASLR is simply set to uh, its, its standard implementation, you can see that only one, two, three, four bytes of entropy are used for the heap. For other libraries, it is perhaps only one, two, three bytes and three bytes for the rest of this, which is insanely easy to brute force. <clears throat> However, you'll notice that some, certain segments aren't randomized itself, such as for this case, they're using cat. Cat is not randomized, and this is over multiple executions of this uh, uh, target process. And the authors went in to investigate that uh, that the GR security and the PAX patches actually don't fully solve these issues. They do improve the entropy. You can see that um, one, two, three, four, five, maybe six, it's hard to tell, six bytes are being used of entropy, which is a huge improvement, but not everything is being uh, randomized which is a problem um, because I can still hard address um, uh, in an exploit these segments if, for instance, they're executable, which we know they are. <clears throat> so the author illustrates the, the effectiveness of a fully randomized process space in that no hard-coded exploit is going to work against this. Um, and it is suggested that you take necessary protections to uh, enhance the, the weak security mitigations offered by Linux by default. It actually turns out that Windows is perhaps one of the most secure operating systems, although it is perhaps the biggest target on the internet, mainly because of the market share it has and the popularity it has it still has um, excellent uh, implementation of ASLR and other techniques. Now, the Windows uh, surrogate or um, equivalent to NX is DEP, which is Data Execution Prevention. Effectively, you mark anything on a memory page that is writable is also not executable. It makes the stack and the heap not executable, so you can't have any more shellcode there. Um, but you can still have control data there and still can obviously do return into libc and return to library style techniques. ASLR in Windows is enabled by default in Windows Vista and beyond. That was back in 2007. However, it's only for executables and DLS that are specifically linked to be ASLR enabled. In other words, the compiling linker in that phase, in the linker phase, that sets whether or not things are ASLR enabled. And most developers don't know about ASLR and don't know to compile and link things in this way. <clears throat> so there is a registry uh, uh, value that if you set it will force ASLR for all executables and libraries. Um, and by default in, in Windows, the heap, the stack, the PEB, the TEB, haven't really covered these, and that's fine. You won't be required to know them. Are randomized, um, but uh, there are techniques specific to Windows and specific to Linux and specific to other operating systems to defeat their implementations of ASLR. Sometimes they rely on memory exhaustion, and sometimes they rely on other nuances. So this is by far not a comprehensive coverage of how to beat ASLR. This is for reference.
Uh, GS stack cookies is a compiler option that adds to a function's prolog and epilogue code to prevent overwriting a return address and other useful pointers. Um, it has been enabled by default in 2000, since 2003 um, and it can be disabled, however, it's never recommended. Um, but it allows you to detect buffer overflows that try to target the return address, as we've already stated. So, usually you cannot read the, if say you're exploiting a remote service, you can't read that random value that's on the stack that's protecting the return address. So, that mitigates your ability to exploit a stack based buffer overflow or stack based vulnerability um, and target that control flow data because you have to guess that cookie right. Well, that is something that can be brute forced. Perhaps it would take all night to do it, but um, that is one way to attack GS cookies. Heap protections in Windows are a bit better than Linux. There's no DL malloc um, safe unlink implementation as we just demonstrated exploiting earlier. Um, and the Windows take on this focuses on hardening the heap allocator algorithm preventing heap overflows and implementing safe unlinking. Um, to do this, Windows uses meta cookies, uh, a safer unlink algorithm, and it also goes to the efforts of uh, encoding pointers um, with a key or zoring them um, as they sit statically in memory. So they're really hard to find, so we can't do that level of debugging to develop an exploit. Um, just all it does is obfuscates the heap effectively, so it makes it harder to work with. So, um, the other thing that Windows does great is EMET, the Enhanced uh, the Exploit Mitigation Experience Toolkit, uh, whatever it stands for, I forget. It implements better implementations of ASLR, DEP, SEHOP, which is the answer to SEH exploitation and is an effective exploit mitigation that has rendered an entire class of popular Windows exploitation effectively ineffective. It's no longer really a viable nor popular exploitation avenue. That is the realm of SEH exploitation. You should note for the exam that SEHOP prevents SEH exploitation pretty damn well, especially when combined with DEP and ASLR, stack cookies, and everything else. Railroad, um, this basically involves reordering of segments and also <clears throat> the contents of the segments, which makes a lot of exploits very difficult to pull off. Then there's various other mitigations that make exploitation even harder. Mem protect simulated execution flow, stack pivot, load libraries, uh, heap spray detection, etc., etc., etc. Emet is something that is unparalleled on other operating systems, which I believe puts Windows uh, ahead of the game as far as security goes. It's still the most attacked operating system in the world, as it seems by malware authors. So to recap. Um, the linker and the compiler implement stack cookies. Basically, it, it, it has prolog and epilog, either metadata or code, to make sure that when a return, return is called, that the cookie hasn't been overwritten or also called the canary. ASLR is usually implemented by the operating system because that has a large role to play when the process space is all initialized. Um, DEP is the equivalent of NX on Windows side, and there can be a number of different implementations for it. It's either a combination between the linker and the file and the operating system for software-based DEP, or the operating system and hardware, and we'll get more into this later. Haven't really covered code signing checks. They are extremely effective at preventing exploitation and perhaps uh, the installation of malware on your devices. Um, and that is all we have for today's lecture. We'll pick this stuff up a little bit uh, later in the coming weeks as 
we now take a break to go into network uh, and the, what you need to know about networking for this class.